Good evening, I'm Bo Williams and welcome to The 7. Let's get a look at the Big 7 stories right now. And topping the list for us tonight, a family now picking up the pieces after a fire claimed their home last week. Four people were inside the home at the time of the fire. Starting last Tuesday, the Cave family was sitting in their living room to start winding down for the evening before Bryson and Jessica Caves decided to head upstairs. That's when the unthinkable happened. When we went upstairs, she followed up shortly after and the lights flickered. We thought it was the wind because the wind was blowing pretty bad. Then I asked her, I said, do you smell smoke? And she said, yeah. Then we saw it traveling through the doorway and I went to the doorway and looked and I stared death in the face. You know, along with all of their belongings, the caves lost uh, were numerous animals as well inside the home that unfortunately did not make it out. The family is currently looking at getting a new house in the same spot along Highview Road with a goal of $5,000 for a down payment on a mobile home. As of this evening, the family raised roughly $100 toward that goal. A bus driver contracted by Knox County Schools has now been arrested, suspected of driving a bus full of kids under the influence this morning. We're told Knox County School security staff alerted KPD to potential issues, so Knoxville police arrived at Holston Middle School around 8.55 this morning. The driver identified as 63-year-old Matthew Levesque was given a field sobriety test and arrested, suspected of driving drunk. KPD tells us 19 students were on the bus at the time of the arrest. Levesque was a contractor working for Lynch Bus Line. Knox County Schools has since removed him from the district's roster of eligible drivers. Now, in a statement, district leaders say, quote, KCS does not tolerate this type of behavior or any unsafe activity on buses that serve our students. Leaders continued by saying, quote, all families whose students were on the bus were made aware of the incident and arrangements have been made to cover transportation going forward. New details tonight for you after a small single engine plane crashed into the Tennessee River earlier this week. The Federal Aviation Administration has now released its preliminary report and it turns out the plane did not just crash. The pilot was actually trying to land in the river. The crash happened earlier this week. It was around 7.30 in the evening. Just the pilot was on board when he crashed into the river near the downtown Island Airport. The pilot was able to escape with no injuries. He was landing in the river because the plane was a seaplane, which can, of course, land on water, but crashed for unknown reasons and flipped over. As we learn more about this investigation, of course, we're going to update you with more. A low barrier homeless shelter, the foyer is now set to close Sunday as the Joint Office of Housing Stability looks for a service provider to take over operations. The foyer is currently operated by the Volunteer Ministry Center and holds 30 beds. According to the Office of Housing and Stability, they have been struggling with staffing overnights. Matter of fact, in a newsletter, the VMC shared this was because of a loss of grant funding, increasing operation costs, and staffing challenges. However, they are making living arrangements for those who utilize the facility, and they say they will continue to operate portable showers, the safe space, and multiple emergency warming shelters will open if the temperature drops below freezing. VMC has been working with homeless services partners to find alternative arrangements for these individuals while they go through the process of seeking permanent housing. Um, and a lot of those uh, other nonprofit partners are, are ones who've agreed to, uh, you know, to provide those alternative arrangements for individuals who are currently in the foyer. According to the Office of Housing Stability, the center's main goal was always been to acquire permanent housing. Currently, there is no organization with the capacity needed to take over operations of the shelter. Our next big story, a new look at the aftermath of the Baltimore Bridge disaster. The National Transportation Safety Board releasing video, you see some of it behind me here, of hazardous materials investigators and engineers now going on board the cargo ship Dolly, checking on containers of potentially dangerous goods. According to the Coast Guard, most of the hazardous material is at the rear of the ship. Plans call for removing 13 damaged containers before other salvage work moves ahead. Investigators say 56 of the ship's 4,700 containers hold dangerous goods, but they say there is no threat to the public. Now, two containers were knocked overboard in the collision with the Francis Scott Key Bridge, but those did not have hazardous materials inside. The onboard team today was able to download data from the ship's voyage data recorder to help get a better idea of what happened in the moments before the dolly went out of control and crashed into a bridge pier. Now tonight, the Port of Baltimore still blocked. A supply chain disruption task force from the National Economic Council says shipments are being rerouted. 
Back here in Knoxville, we spoke today with Kit Johnson from the John S. James Company, which deals in logistics and transportation involving cargo ships. We wanted to know how the Key Bridge collapse could impact industries here in Tennessee. Definitely automotive and uh, farm equipment. Uh, so I think 40 to 50 percent of the freight that was moving through Baltimore is automotive related. So you would look at companies like VW or, or Nissan potentially being impacted in Tennessee. Um, but there was also a great amount of farm equipment that was coming through. Um, those are really the major impacts, um, but we, we have customers across all industries that have had impacts from this. I don't think it's, it's the most major disruption that could have happened. For sure, there's a lot of rerouting that has to be done, which means there's gonna be congestion potentially in other ports. Johnson calls the Baltimore Bridge collapse a wake-up call for the industry, highlighting just how important it is for companies to make sure they have a diverse supply chain. Rural Metro Fire telling us that the driver of a truck was trapped in the wreckage for two and a half hours. According to Rural Metro first responders, they had to cut the truck's cab away piece by piece, all while providing medical care for the driver. Matter of fact, some of these pictures posted to Facebook of that truck that tipped over on its side. Again, Rural Metro says it was fully loaded with cement. It all started around 1130. The wreck blocked both lanes of East Emory Road at Stormer, east of Maynardville Pike. More new information from Rural Metro telling us an SUV was the other vehicle that was involved in this incident. Uh, people in that SUV saying they did not need any medical help. As for the cement truck driver, we're told that once he was cut free, he was flown by a Lifestar helicopter to the UT Medical Center's trauma unit. Rural Metro describes his injuries as apparently not life-threatening. Rural Metro tells us East Emory Road, though, is back open. We're wrapping up the Big 7 with the Sweet 16. Ball basketball gearing up for tomorrow's Sweet 16 matchup against Creighton. Sports director Reese Van Haften uh, has made the trip to Detroit with the team and has more ahead of tomorrow's battle on the hardwood. Hey, Reese. Hey, Bo, it should be a good one tomorrow. The Vols are looking to make the Elite Eight for the first time since 2008. It's been a long time for this Tennessee team. Uh, they wrapped up practice over there at Little Caesars Arena just inside the curtains over there about two hours ago. Uh, the team was having a good time in the first 15 minutes when the media was allowed in there. They were dancing. Cam Carr was chugging up shots while facing a coach one-on-one. -on -one. And then, uh, you know, Jemai Meshack was joking around with Josiah Jordan James. The only person that wasn't having a good time who wasn't having a good time was Santiago Vescovi. He was on the floor, but he's been dealing with the sickness he's trying to fight through so that he can play tomorrow. Rick Barnes did talk about that and said that he should be good to go for tomorrow. If he's not able to go, you will slide Jemai Meshack into that spot on the wing uh, in that corner, that number two spot that shoots threes over there to help the offense. But we'll see what comes of it. We're going to have coverage all day tomorrow leading up to tip off which is a late one, Bo. You might, you might want to get your coffee ready for that one because uh, 10 o'clock, that might be a little past our bedtimes. <laughs> it is going to be a late night. That is for sure. Reese, thank you very much, buddy. We'll talk to you tomorrow.